I'm going to begin by reading our text, verses 10 through 12, and a message that I have entitled, The Hope of the Gospel. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. In his book, The Attributes of God, A.W. Pink writes this, The gospel contemplates every descendant of Adam as a fallen, polluted, hell-deserving, and helpless sinner. The grace which the gospel publishes is his only hope. All stand before God convicted as transgressors of his holy law, as guilty and condemned criminals, who are not merely awaiting sentence, but the execution of sentence already passed upon them. To complain against the partiality of grace is suicidal. If the sinner insists upon bare justice, then the lake of fire must be his eternal portion. His only hope lies in bowing to the sentence which divine justice has passed upon him, owning the absolute righteousness of it, casting himself on the mercy of God, and stretching forth empty hands to avail himself of the grace of God now made known to him in the gospel." The gospel of Jesus Christ is a glorious message which provides hope for the life to come and steadfast encouragement as you and I face the various trials of life. This is why the gospel is at the forefront of Peter's letter to these dear saints who were being distressed by various trials as we looked at last time in verse 6 as he says, in this You greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Peter, in these verses that Jonathan took us through last week, gave us the various benefits that come to us as believers as we embrace the trials and the persecutions of this life. And he ends verse 9 by declaring that glorification. The outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls, that glorification is the great reality that awaits all those in Christ enduring the ongoing trials of this life. And friends, you can take great assurance in the fact that regardless of the persecutions and fiery trials that you undergo in this life, that Jesus is your great reward. One day these things, these trials, these persecutions, these difficulties will be no more. And you will be enthralled with the eternal presence of Jesus Christ and the perfection that accompanies his presence forever. And here in our text this evening, verses 10 through 12 of this first chapter, Peter continues to encourage his readers by dialing in on the source of this hope, which is the gospel message itself. Peter describes for us in these verses the details for how this glorious message got to us to save us and and to give us hope. And, And in doing so, in delivering us that information, he underscores the divine nature of this message. Because you know that this gospel message that we preach, that we hold on to, that we base our lives upon is not simply a human message that was conjured up by somebody in the past. No, rather it is the message of God himself. And it is the only message that brings about true conversion. Oh, there have been lots of other gospels. There have been lots of other men who have come up with messages that that cause us to think we can get to heaven somehow. But those messages that were conjured up in men's minds are are not the message of the gospel itself. It is the message 
of God through His Word, the proclamation of Jesus Christ, that is the only message that brings about the true conversion of souls, that brings about forgiveness of sins, that brings about you on the pathway to eternity with Jesus. And here in these verses, we find four crucial realities concerning the gospel message that are, that are meant to encourage believers as we are the ones selected to experience this gospel in all of its fullness. And that first reality that we find is in verse 10, and it is this. It is the prophet's precision. The prophet's precision. Look at verse 10 with me. He says, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would to come to you made careful searches and inquiries. And notice how Peter connects the dots between what he was just referencing back in verses 6 through 9 and with our section here tonight. He says, as to this salvation, that is what was just being talked about in, in verse 9 that Jonathan finished with. Peter is declaring that this salvation that is looked forward to in the future by believers was also prophesied about in the past. Peter is not just coming up with some new material to try and encourage these struggling believers with. No, rather he is seeking to bring greater encouragement and greater hope by explaining that this message of hope and, and victory and forgiveness is one that was declared by the Old Testament prophets of the past. And it is the Old Testament prophets that Peter has in mind here. These were men who were chosen by God to foretell God's message to the people, whether it was by way of messages of judgment or whether it was salvation. And here particularly, the message of the prophets that Peter highlights is the grace that would to come. That would come. The grace that would, would come. This, this is the message of the gospel. And the hope that comes from this message. And Peter in our text is, is bringing encouragement by, by explaining that, that the message that the prophets declared was specifically for them, that is, the readers of the first century, but it is also for us. It's also for you and I here in the 21st century. You see, the, the prophets of the Old Testament predicted these things. And these prophets hoped that these things would come and that they would be fulfilled in their lifetime. But Peter is encouraging the New Testament Christians that they, they haven't hoped for this, that they haven't predicted this, but the New Testament Christians have now experienced the fulfillment of these prophecies concerning Christ, something that the Old Testament prophets could only hope for. See, notice Peter's point here. This message that the prophets foretold was not just something that they had heard through the grapevine and were now passing down flippantly, or something that they, had, they themselves had, had conjured up. But rather, these prophets, as verse 10 tells us, were incredibly precise in their investigation re regarding the particulars of this message that had been entrusted to them. And notice in verse 10 how Peter describes this precision. He says that they made careful searches and inquiries. Uh, these are two verbs in the Greek language used here to describe the prophet's investigation, which, which are working in unison. The first one means to, to search out earnestly. And the second one is similar in meaning, to, to diligently make careful inquiry. So when you put these together, that is to say that this was an ardent investigation which was tireless in seeking for clarity and precision. This was an investigation that, that went to the greatest lengths possible to find the answer that they were looking for. And what was it that they were seeking? What was it that these prophets were, were, were looking for? Well, look at verse 11. It says they were seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. You see, the prophet's responsibility was to figure out the prophecies they received concerning the Messiah 
to the best of their ability. Now that's what they were researching. Who is this one to come? What is he going to do when he does come? What is this Messiah going to be like? How is this Messiah going to come and to save his people? What was the timing of these prophecies? When would this happen? Notice who was both instigating and and guiding this search process. As you look at verse 10, it tells us that it was was the Spirit of Christ within them. It was the Spirit of Christ within them. Verse 11, rather. The Spirit of Christ is the Spirit sent from Christ. This This is the Holy Spirit. Don't miss the theology that we see here in these verses. First, Peter's acknowledgement of the Spirit of Christ speaks to the pre-existent Christ, which which emphasizes His deity. Jesus Christ has has existed eternally. He he is indeed God, and Peter was, was highlighting that reality. But second, the Spirit of Christ also highlights for us that this message that the prophets searched out, it is divine, and therefore it is authoritative. You see, the book that you are holding right now in your hands is divine and authoritative. It is everything you need to know concerning God. It is everything you need to know concerning how to attain eternal life. It is everything you need to know, Christian, for life and godliness. Why? Because it contains the fullness of what the prophets searched out and identified under the, holy, under the authority of the Holy Spirit. This book is true, and you can trust it. And more specifically to our text, the gospel is true, and you can trust it. And you are to be genuinely encouraged by that reality. There's a second crucial reality concerning the gospel message meant to encourage us, and that is this. It is the prophet's prediction. The prophet's prediction. Well, not only did... The Holy Spirit guide the the searching process of these Old Testament prophets. He also gave them what they were to predict. You see, the the prophet's job included not only researching the the prophecies they they were given, but also foretelling or predicting those prophecies through declaring that message that they had been given. They were to foretell with with solemn assurance what was communicated to them by God concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice exactly what they were to declare. Look again at your text, verse 11. It says that he predicted the the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. This is the core of the gospel message. First of all, note the, the sufferings of Christ. These sufferings that, the, that Peter is referring to, they include the mistreatment of Christ, the injustice of Christ, the physical pain of Christ, the humiliation of Christ, ultimately the death of Christ, and the turning of the Father's face away from His Son as He bore in His body the sins of those who would believe. This is Christ becoming our sin-bearer so that we you and I might be declared righteous before a holy God. You are familiar with the primary Old Testament text that declare the, these predictions concerning our Lord, and that's Isaiah chapter 53. If you want to turn there with me for just a moment, it's worth certainly highlighting. This is, this is the primary text in the Old Testament speaking of the sufferings of Christ that were to come. The prophet writes, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom him might whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And here's the description of that affliction. He was pierced through for our transgressions. 
He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. He goes on to say, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Christ bore in his body the iniquity of all of those whom he had chosen before the foundation of the world and whom he was to redeem. It goes on in verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due, his grave was assigned with wicked men. Yet he was was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. And notice this affliction here in verse 10. But Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of Yahweh will prosper in his hand. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the midi, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, Because he poured out himself to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. That is what the prophets were searching out. That that is what the prophets were inquiring about. And that is what the prophets were predicting in the Old Testament, that this one would come and he would be crushed. He would be crushed by men, but ultimately he'd be crushed by his father. For what purpose? To justify the many. To pay for the sin of the many. To give his life as a sacrifice for the sin of all those who would come to him by faith. These were the sufferings of our Lord. This is what Christ did for for sinners like you and and sinners like me. He, He bore our sins in his body and he paid in that sacrifice for our sin, the payment for our sin. And specifically to Peter's point, Christ did this for you specifically, Christian. He did this for you. But not only did they predict Christ's sufferings, they also predicted his glories to follow. You see, after Christ suffered greater suffering than any person ever had or or any person ever will. He rose from the dead and proved his complete triumph over evil, his complete triumph over sin, his complete triumph over the grave. And this is where we find in great encouragement, Christian, that Christ's suffering eventually led glory, which serves as a pattern by Peter here to encourage persecuted and afflicted Christians. Glories, the glory of heaven is in store for you following your sufferings in this life. The sufferings of this life, the persecutions of this life, the trials of this life, the tribulations of this life, the hardships of this life are not all there are. Christ didn't suffer and continue to suffer. No, Christ suffered and then he triumphed to glory. For what purpose? So that you and I, though we will suffer in this life, one day we will also triumph in glory as we will be with the one who has triumphed over all things. We find great encouragement in that. Glories are in store to follow your sufferings in this life. You know, Paul says in Romans 8 that the afflictions of this life are are not even worthy to be compared with the glories that will come. And it's Christ's glorification that assures your glorification. Sufferings 
you know as well as I do, are, are inevitably going to find you in this life as a follower of Jesus Christ. And certainly, they're probably going to find us a lot faster than they have in the past. And they're going to find you, and they're going to find me because we live life in a fallen world that has been, been cursed, where sin resides. They're inevitably going to be here, but rest assured that Christ's sufferings ended in glory, and yours will too. Find encouragement in that. Find joy in that. Find hope in that. Don't, don't let the sufferings of this life, whatever you're going through, that, that list, it can encapsulate a lot of things. For some of you, it might be specific persecution in your workplace or, or from family members. For some of you, you might be dealing with, with a health crisis that you never thought you would have to face. For some of you, it might be children who have wandered from the Lord, and you don't know what that looks like. You, don't, you are going to have sufferings in this life, and you don't have to let those sufferings bring you down and bring you to the depths. You can rejoice because your suffering is only temporary. And that is because of the truth and the power of the gospel. Christ triumphed over his sufferings. One day you and I will triumph over our sufferings if you are in Christ. I appreciate what Horatius Bonar said concerning this in a sermon about 150 years ago. He said, the road to the kingdom is not so pleasant and comfortable and easy and flowery as many dream. It is not a bright, sunny avenue of palms. It is not paved with triumph, though it is to end in victory. The termination is glory, honor, immortality. But on the way, there is the thorn in the flesh, the sackcloth, and the cross. Recompense later, but labor here. Rest later, weariness here. Joy and security later, but here endurance and watchfulness. The race, the battle, the burden, the stumbling block, and oftentimes the heavy heart. Sufferings must always precede glory, and Peter encourages us with that truth seen in the life of our Lord. Well, there is a third crucial reality concerning the gospel message that is meant to encourage believers in this text, and that is this. It is the preacher's proclamation. The preacher's proclamation. Look at verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. In these things which now have been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. You could see the flow of Peter's thought continue here, relating to his readers how this gospel message meant to encourage them came to be attained. You see, the prophets received divine revelation from God. They searched out the, the meaning of that prophecy diligently. They then predicted that, that prophecy. And here in verse 12, it tells us that it was then revealed to them that this, this prediction was specifically for those after them and not actually for them themselves. The prophets had a great privilege and responsibility to be the ones who searched out this prophecy, the details of the Messiah, then to proclaim it and to predict it. But ultimately, it was for the purpose, Peter says, of the full gospel being disclosed to the New Testament church by way of the preacher's proclamation. That verb revealed there in verse 12, is what we refer to as a divine passive, meaning that this, this purpose was revealed to the prophets by God, 
God is the one who told them that this is not specifically for you, but this is for the church to come. This is for those to come. God revealed to these prophets that this research and and prediction was, was not specifically to serve themselves. That verb, serve, means to to function as a go-between, to be at one's service. This is who the prophets were. The prophets served as a go-between. Notice there in the middle of verse 12 the emphasis that Peter gives to who this message was ultimately for. It says, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, But you, he says, this this is the divine intention of the prophet's message, to give it to you, to give it to, to the readers that were reading Peter's message, and to all of the following generations, including you and I who are sitting here tonight. Notice then how this message came to these readers and and how it has come to us. It says there in verse 12, which has now been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you. Well, here in verse 12, we see this delegated role, this divine role of the preacher. To take that researched, predicted prophecy concerning the, the sufferings and, and the glory of Christ, and then to declare it to the generations. And you see that preposition through there in verse 12. It says that that is to indicate to us, rather, that the preacher of the gospel is God's divine means of communication of that truth, of that diligently searched out, predicted truth to people. And we see this truth reflected in other New Testament passages. For instance, Romans chapter 10, verse 14, how will they hear, speaking of the gospel, without a preacher? Or in 2 Timothy 4, 2, As Paul commands Timothy, preach the word. Or in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, the spirit gave the gift of pastor pastor, teacher to the church for the edification of the body. You see, the preacher preaching the message of God is essential. It is non-negotiable. We live in a day where people are trying to reinvent church. They're trying to reinvent what takes place from the prescribed pages of Scripture on a Sunday morning and a Sunday evening. And you name it. I bet if you named it, it would probably be done in some sort of quote-unquote church somewhere, regardless of how wild it might seem. Friends, this must never be the case. God has ordained preachers to declare the message of the prophets, which they wrote down and which we hold a copy of in our hands. Preachers are to declare the truth. What happens here on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings and in the Sunday school classes across this campus is the declaration of the truth of the Word of God. And that is the prescribed means handed down by God through the prophets to us. This is what we do. And what happens? Well, people sit under the proclaimed message of the truth of the Word of God. Then the Spirit takes that message and He knits it to their hearts and conforms them more to the the image of Jesus Christ and they obey and they love Him more and they serve Him more and they grow. That's the means. And so it was never to stop with with the inquiry of the prophets and with the searching of the prophets and with the prediction of the prophets. It was always in God's plan for the preacher then to take that searched out material and to proclaim the message of the truth of the Word of God, the gospel, to the generations. Preachers are to preach the gospel thoroughly and authoritatively. Not because they are acting on their own authority. There is no authority inherent in the man who is up here declaring the truth. No, but because they have been commissioned by Christ and they are under His authority. Preachers are not to to preach their, their own ideas and opinions, but only that which has been passed down to them by the prophets and that which is contained in the very Word of God. Preachers are also not to preach in their own power. Notice this in the text. 
As it says, the preachers preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. They are to preach in the power of the Holy Spirit and and according to, to His guidance, which He gives through the Word. The Holy Spirit is the source of the preacher's message, the source of the power of the preacher's message. Not the preacher's own cunning or or crafty ways. And this Holy Spirit, Peter says, was was sent from heaven. This indicates the divine origin and, and authority of the gospel message. You see, this gospel that you and I have heard, and most of you in this room have received, was not invented by someone down the line who who had too much time on their hands. No, this gospel message originated with the triune God of this universe who has faithfully and deliberately assured by the Holy Spirit that it has fallen on the ears of sinners across this planet by the means that he has ordained. Believer, you can be overwhelmingly confident and assured and find deep-seated encouragement in the fact that the gospel message that has been faithfully delivered to you by the proclamation of the preacher and the message that you believed, it will sustain you in this world and it will lead you to heaven. It will save you. It will secure you. And to Peter's point... It will comfort you in the trials and the tribulations of this life. It will bring you through the various trials of this life all the way to the end. Why? Because it is sourced in God and it is empowered by God. And this gospel message that is preached must be, as Spurgeon said, the mark of of all true gospel preaching, where Christ is everything and the creature is nothing, where it is is salvation, all of grace, through the work of the Holy Spirit, applying to the soul the precious blood of Jesus. Be encouraged in whatever state you find yourself in today, whatever that might be. Because God has seen fit in his kindness and his grace to get the gospel to you by the means of faithful preaching, you can be secure in that. Find joy in that. Find rest in that. Find comfort in that. And finally, friends, we see a fourth crucial reality concerning the gospel message meant to encourage believers in this text, and that is this. It is the personal privilege. The personal privilege. Well, as we get to the end of verse 12, we find a very interesting phrase. A phrase which at first glance can cause one to scratch their head and wonder why Peter included it in this text. However, the the phrase provides great encouragement for us if we understand what Peter had in mind. The phrase is this. You see it there at the end of verse 12. Things into which angels long to look. Let's break this apart. First of all, what is things referring to here in verse 12? Well, these things are the things which the prophets prophesied about and the things which the preacher proclaimed. These things refer to all the components of the gospel message, including the realities of the message itself, its implications for people, and specifically here, its application to believers. These are the things which angels long to understand. You see, we know that angels were created by God during the first week when God created the heavens and the earth. We find that in Genesis chapter 1. They are not divine. They are not eternal. Angels are never to be worshipped. They were created by God to serve Him in various ways and to be His messengers and to serve His people. It's important to understand one other thing about angels, and that is this. That they are not humans. They do not need salvation. 
The angels who did not go with Satan when he sinned are holy angels and not in need of salvation. And the fallen angels, on the other hand, the ones who did go with Satan when he fell, cannot be saved. They are unique creatures with a, with a unique purpose. But they do not have the privilege of participating in the application of the gospel message. This privilege that Peter is speaking of here is reserved for believers on this earth. That's Peter's point. This privilege is ours. He is encouraging his readers in the first century and us here this evening in the fact that we alone, friends, human beings on this planet have been granted an immense privilege that can only be looked upon by even the angels. To look upon here in verse 12 means that they have an intense, strong desire to understand all of the glorious truths of the gospel and its particular application and benefit to believers, something they don't have the privilege of participating in. No doubt, believe, no doubt angels understand salvation at an intellectual level. They understand what Christ came and did, but they can't understand it in the same way that you and I can understand it, having been, having been participants in it, having it having had it applied to us as individuals. They reflect and delight on the gospel, but they don't have the privilege of experiencing it personally or individually. That privilege is reserved for human believers. For you and I around this room tonight who have been saved by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, we have an immense personal privilege when it comes to the application and the benefit of the gospel message in our lives. In fact, we are the most privileged creatures in this universe. And no trial, no persecution, no awful situation can ever remove that privilege. And that privilege will lead us one day to being in the presence of the eternal God of this universe in a state of eternal bliss and joy forever worshiping this one who in his grace has ordained this unspeakable privilege for us. This is an amazing text. Peter's goal in this text is to encourage us. It was to encourage these first century believers. It's to encourage us with the hope of the gospel and its power to sustain us through the trials in this life. And he did that by explaining the prophet's precision and searching out the truth of the message that they were given. And through the faithful prediction of the suffering and glorified Messiah to come and in, in the faithful proclamation of the preacher as the means to communicate that truth to us. And finally, by exclaiming the immense personal privilege that you and I have to be the ones who get to benefit from the application of this message to our lives. Amazing divine truth. As we close our time together this evening, let me just leave you with that glorious gospel message once again. That Christ, the God-man, the very God of eternity past, the second person of the Trinity came to this earth and he took on human flesh. Then he lived a perfect life Without sin, as Pastor Tom referenced so well this morning, without, without sin in every way that we live except with, without sin. And then he went to the cross because he was an approved sacrifice. 
And he died a soul-satisfying, sin-cleansing, wrath-appeasing, substitutionary death on a cross in the place of sinners like you and me. And he rose again then to prove that the Father had accepted his sacrifice. And we are commanded in the Scriptures to repent and to believe in this message. It is Christ and Christ alone who will save you. Friends, it is Christ and Christ alone who's gonna come back. And he's gonna take his bride home to be with him forever. And if you adhere to this message and you come to him in repentance and faith, turning away from your sin and turning and embracing Christ for who he is and what he's done, then he's gonna come and he's gonna rescue you. And you're gonna spend eternity worshiping this one who gave himself for you. I invite you to do that if you haven't done that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this truth, this text. Father, we rejoice in the hope of the gospel. We are dependent upon you and your grace alone to save us. And we are so incredibly thankful for the reality that you have revealed to us this gospel from the very beginning to the very end and made it clear who this Christ is and that we are called to follow him. And the results of that mean forgiveness of sin and everlasting hope in heaven. God, we rejoice because this gospel is not ours, but it is yours. And you have loved us and given it to us in your son. Thank you for our time together in Christ's name. Amen.